Hello and welcome to church. Hello everybody, nice to see you guys. It is good to be back. Uh, if you are new to the church, my name is Gabe Phillips. This is my lovely wife, Fiona. Uh, we had the privilege over the last couple of weekends to be away. Uh, we were in a church in Doha, Qatar, and then in a church in Switzerland. Um, and just God is doing amazing things, and I'll give some more feedback as the time goes on today. But it's so good to be back today. There's a whole lot of cool things we're celebrating. We had uh, Eileen Cruz have her birthday yesterday. Come on, Eileen, give us a wave. She turned 28, I think, hey, is it? There we go, brilliant. And our very own Madison, where's Madison gone? At the back, turned 25, am I right, Madison, on Friday? Come on, yay! Madison is on staff with us, and, uh, and she is such a blessing. And we wanted just to honor you, Madison, and tell you that we love you. We're incredibly proud of you, and we know the best is yet to come. Uh, we've got a little gift that we want to give you as well and celebrate. But um, I think for these two amazing people, we should sing, hey? Everyone ready? Already, three, two, one. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Madison and Eileen. Happy birthday. Come on. Very cool to celebrate and... Uh, Good to be part of an amazing church like this, where we're able to celebrate each other, mourn with those who mourn, rejoice with those who rejoice. It's a whole lot of exciting things happening in our church. We've also got the amazing Devania. Everyone, can you stand up? Can you stand very quickly and wave? Give us a wave to the people that side. Wave to the people that side, Devania. There we go. If you are unaware, she has joined our staff team, and she is being a huge blessing, helping us administratively, but also in the space, in particular, with Life Kids. Uh, we are seeing a lot of kids come through on Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, but we know we're just scratching the surface, and we believe it's going to be an area of incredible growth. But we're also going to see uh, Devon has uh, got dreams and ideas of how she can push us forward along with the team on the ground and bring more life, more strength to that incredibly vital area of ministry, kids' ministry. And so, Devania, we are so chuffed to have you part of the team and pushing us forward there. But one big request from us is that we are needing more volunteers to step up to the plate to help us, especially into the year 2025, um, to come and help serve the kids there. The different age groups, we've got the very young, we've got those who are in primary school as well, and we've got curriculum, we've got uh, uh, volunteer training, we want to equip you, but we're saying it's a great place to invest into the kingdom of God. So even if you say, I've never done that before, but I, I want to be used by God, then you will put you on a rotation where I think it's once every three weeks where you serve and you help uh, train up the next generation in the ways of the Lord. And I can tell you there's nothing more thrilling than sowing into that. So if you are wanting to volunteer or if you have questions and saying, what does it look like? I, I don't know if I've got what it takes, but I'd love to ask some questions. Devania is your person. Give us one more wave, Devania. Come and chat to her. And I can tell you that you'll join a dynamic team, have lots of fun, you'll be stretched, but I believe that you'll look back on your life and go, wow, God used me in a radical way there. So we're so excited about that, and that's going to be amazing. Also, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, as we, normally you only have one celebrity here at church, me. Wow. But today we were led by our very own Majorzy in worship. Where's Majorzy? Give us a wave. Where's he? That's it. Oh, my word. One of my favorite worship leaders in the world. Can you believe it, eh? You came to church today and you got Majorzy and an Ed Sheeran lookalike. Gosh, what a church to be at. But uh, I, I just uh, imagine it's beautiful wife Daniela have been a part of our church for a number of years. They're here predominantly in Sunday night. And he's helped serving us this morning with worship. I just wanted to honor you guys. And I just wanted to just keep reminding you that God has called you. There is such a purity. When I think about you guys as a couple, a purity a love for the gospel, a love for Jesus, and you use your platform to, to bring him glory. And we are so proud of you, and we are so thrilled. And I think that you have got an incredible voice into our nation and into the world through your songs that you write. But I also, when you lead worship, man, there's something that's so beautiful. And I think God's going to take you to stages that are not of your own manufacturing, not even of your own um, advertising, that actually God's going to promote you to declare His glory. And uh, we are just so privileged to have a front row seat to cheer you on. So we love you, man. We really do love you, Daniela. We love you guys. I'm so proud of you, man. Last thing before we get stuck into the Word, as, as that really handsome guy on the screen mentioned, we have got carols coming up in just three weeks' time here on the 8th of December. And uh, if please, please take note that we are in faith making room here. We want to make sure that we are stretching ourselves to invite our world. We're having three services that day. 
So we're shifting our meeting times to 8.30, 10.30, and 5 p.m. And I would love to encourage you to own that with us. This is a faith move because we really believe that actually if every one of us brought one friend, then actually this place will be filled twice over in the morning. And then it'll be filled again in the evening. And we're saying this is not just something that we are trying to uh, do to bless the city. No, we're saying this is for us, the church, to bless our worlds. So we are able to invite those colleagues, those friends. I want to dare you to invite somebody to come with you to church that day. I dare you to to ask, what what time are you available? 8.30, 10.35? And if they're available at 8.30, you come to that service with them. And if you have another friend who's got available for 10.30, you come to that service. But we're going to mobilize everything we can. We, as I, we said, we've got petting zoos. We're going to have food on sale. It's going to be world class. But underneath all of that is we're preaching the good news of Jesus. And I'm trusting for hundreds of salvation that day. Hundreds of salvations. I, I dare you to, why don't you f- say, t- tell the people next to you, there's going to be no space in this row because I'm bringing my friends. Tell them, tell them that. Tell them that. There's going to be no space in our row. You're going to have to find a new row because you're going to have a whole bunch of friends. I'm, I'm trusting that I'm going to personally, my wife and I, we're inviting people from our road, we're inviting people from our, our, our different uh, spheres of life and we, from the schools we're involved in, saying actually we're trusting that this place will be full. So if you're not inviting friends, I'm going to be doing it. So let's do it together. So um, we want to be praying for that. I also encourage you, one request is ask and invite the 8th of December, make sure you're doing that, but also be praying for that time. But also on social media, you'll see we've put a little, uh, a little advert up. Why don't you share that if you're on Facebook, if you're on Instagram, go and share that as well. We're trusting that as we also share that post, we'll be able to see the reach go wider that's beyond our, even our natural resources and see God do amazing things. Give me a wave if you're excited for Christmas and carols. And if you didn't wave, stop being a Grinch. As I mentioned, we were away the last couple of weeks and um, in this incredible church in Doha, in, the, in Qatar, um, just this place that uh, that's, seems the antithesis for where a church would thrive, and yet God is doing miracles. They worked us hard. We preached five times in three days, and then we went to Switzerland, and we preached there a number of times at, at a church that was led um, by my, my first pastors in Durban, where I encountered Jesus. They um, discipled me and released me to, to Cape Town. Then years later, they went and plant, uh, took over a church in Switzerland. And in, in some of the toughest conditions, they are seeing the gospel thrive. We even baptized there while I was there a couple of people in a freezing cold lake. And uh, it was very cold. But it was very good because the life of God was on the move. But it was, so, it was such a thrill to be able to release, but also such an even bigger thrill to come back home. Um, I arrived home on Monday and my wife had my two kiddies there. I'd been away for two weeks from them. And they sprinted to me and I felt like a king. I was like, I, I'm, a, I'm a king because these guys were so excited to see me. And then I won't tell you what Fiona did, but heck, we kissed. Mm, It was amazing. It was wonderful. So I did tell you what Fiona did. Anyway. But it's it's a thrill to be back home with some of the best people in the world. It's really good to be back at Life Changes. The best church in the world, hey? Everyone agree? Good, 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 good. But um, something that was incredible as we came home, we had uh, came face to face with something called the, the preschool stomach bug. It's been doing the rounds at the, my son's preschool, and everyone has been uh, taking turns. And uh, it didn't skip our home. It was a, a wonderful welcome home as my son, Benjamin, age five, spent one evening this week just hurling his guts everywhere. It was like, welcome home, Dad. It's beautiful. And, uh, and this man is incredible. He's dramatic. He's loud. He vomited on his bedroom floor. He vomited in the passageway. He even made it to the bathroom but missed the toilet. And it was like a Jackson Pollock painting. It was beautiful. Thank you for the one laugh, Leanne. I appreciate that. It was wonderful, and uh, as my wife consoled him and gave him the medicine, I was only too pleased to get on my hands and knees at one in the morning and uh, get all the, the disinfectant out and, the, and the, the, the toilet paper and the cloths and clean up three loads of vomit. It was just like wonderful. I felt like my family was saying, welcome home. It's good to have you back. <laughs> Guys, life is hard. Life is hard. And it, it took me back to a moment where I thought, this is wonder. I love serving my family this moment because a while back, I had a stomach bug at a different moment in time. And um, I was in a, room, in a house trying to keep the volume down, and I was, but I, it, was, it was bad. And I was vomiting loudly, and I was trying to keep it quiet, but then I got to back to bed, and I went a second time and vomited again. I know there's a lot of vomit talk, but just stick with me. Third time, vomiting loud, and I'm just, I'm hands, you know that moment when you feel defeated? You just feel this is the lowest I can go. I am paler than I am now. Just it was like, I'm holding on to 
the, the white porcelain of the toilet, and I'm feeling I've got no lower depths to go. I'm feeling so weak, so fragile. And then I hear the sweetest sound ever, my wife walking into the bathroom. I think, here she is. She's going to hear to come and rub my shoulders, to hold my hair back, you know, as I vomit. I don't know, whisper sweet, nothing's in my ear saying, it's going to be okay, you are, you're a hero, you're a man. No, 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 she walked in to shut the door and said, could you keep it down, please? <laughs> True story. Life is hard, guys, life is hard. Life is hard, guys. We were in Doha, and uh, as we were preaching there, that very weekend we were in Doha, the government had one complaint about one church that was operating, and so they, instead of investigating that complaint, they just swiftly shut down 60 churches. 60 churches were shut down overnight. People had to go, and people who were there on short-term visas are now scrambling and trying to navigate how, what is their existence going to look like, how they're going to meet. Just in one moment, a, a government says, no, those churches can't meet. 60 churches closed overnight. Life is hard. We were in Switzerland where the wealth is astronomical, but we were told that actually in the last year or so that Switzerland has steadily risen in the highest uh, rates worldwide in the area of suicide. Life is hard. Interest rates, petrol prices, life is hard. Anxiety, depression, life is hard. Family stress, job stress, relational breakdowns, life is hard. Standing firm in your convictions in this day and age, life is hard. Being an England rugby fan, life is hard. But we're in this series called Exiles, and we're coming into land as we'll finish it next week, but we're into chapter five this week. But the series is based on the book of 1 Peter, where the apostle Peter is writing to a church who is scattered around the the ancient Roman world, and uh, they're being crushed by pressure, They're being seduced by pleasure because of the political eye of the day. They are losing their jobs because of their followership of Jesus Christ. They're losing their homes. They're losing their families. They're being embarrassed for being followers of Jesus. They're being tortured for being followers of Jesus. There's even death on the back of the fact that they are followers of Jesus. Let me tell you, life is hard. And Peter's reminding these people, life is hard, yes, but God is good. Life is hard, but God is good. And we want to land this in this place today. So I want to ask you to stand to your feet. 1 Peter chapter 5. Reading from the ESV. It will be on the screen behind me. Peter, in his final chapter of this letter to encourage a church who are experiencing life in all its hard realities. He says, so I exhort thee, the, exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. And as we stand to attention, to your word right now. We stand not out of religious rhetoric or religious observance. We stand knowing that your strengthening will come. Feeble knees that are buckling under the pressure will start to be strengthened. Hearts that are quaking under an uncertain future will start to be strengthened. Minds that are being dictated to by the fears and anxieties of this world will start to be strengthened. I declare that when life is hard, God is still good. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Why don't you be seated? A 
before we dive into the meat of this text today, I just want to make an opening salvo that the, the first four verses, it's almost like Peter changes tact. He's been talking about suffering and submitting to authorities, and he's been putting wiring conviction deep in the people that there's a, an eternal living hope, that actually that, that God is working even beneath, beneath all the suffering and the pressures and the toils. Stand firm, he's calling them. Aliens and strangers in this world, there's a different disposition. There's a different reality. And then in chapter five, he says, now I want to talk to the elders of the church that you're meeting in. And something that so strikes me in this moment indicates up front that Peter's trying to remind us as aliens and strangers of two things. Number one, that this idea of church community is not an optional extra. I love this fact that he's speaking to this group of people. He's not writing to individual Christians living in abroad and trying to navigate a life. He's writing to a group of believers who have been gathered together by God's designation, God's orchestration. And though they are in a foreign land, a foreign place, they're aliens and strangers, exiles in a different place. It's not fable conditions, but he says you've been placed together by the divine hands of God. And it's not an optional extra. Not just something to say, oh, do I feel like going to church? Let's try out that church. Let's, I like their worship. I like their preaching. Ooh, I like their coffee. But my friends go there, so I'll pop in and, and pop out at different moments. No, no, it's not an optional extra. Not something to be tagged on. And through this lens, we understand because I, I was in this church with Fee this last week, a uh, couple weekends ago in Doha, and this church where it is a Muslim nation, unapologetically a Muslim nation. You are hearing the call to prayer all throughout the day. You are realizing this, this church building that they meet in, which is not a church building, it's a villa that they, have, they are they're using, a big home that they've bashed out walls and gathering for three services and people from all the different ethnic uh, realities from, from Asia and, and uh, Northern Africa, all are gathering in this place. And they meet there in this building where they have bomb ballasts around the building to stop uh, would-be suicide bombers coming to bomb their church. This is the reality of church. They have to arrive at different times. They've had to have conversations saying, actually, don't come and park on different places. You have to park miles and walk because we want to make sure that we give the government no reason to come and sh shut us down. And it's this reality when you're there, there's this deep sense of all these migrant laborers who are there at the, the whim of the, 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 the Islam government. They're there working hard six days a week, and then one day off they're gathering, they're coming from miles to come to this church, and when they walk in, there is such joy, there's such exuberance, they're being, some of them being paid minimal wage, some of them being so abused and broken, some of them can't go back to their own homeland because they're there because of their faith in Christ, and God is doing this radical thing, but as you talk to these people, church for them is not an optional extra, this is a divine necessity, because they said everything out there is so foreign. It's so different. It's so polar to what, opposite to what we know. This thing is an essential. We have to be there. Because out there we're aliens and strangers. But in here, this is our home. This is our people. This is where we find strength. And I go, hey, it was very overt there. I go, but it's the same here. It should be. One Peter's telling us that actually in our lives, Cape Town initially is actually not your primary home. You're an alien and a stranger here. Your home is in heaven with him, but this is our people on earth, that God wants to put us together. This is not just a man-made thing. How do we fill time on a Sunday? This is a divine necessity. The world during COVID said church is, an, is it's not an essential service. I tell you, it is an essential service. It's an essential gathering, and, I, and God needs to grip our hearts in this reality, and I love the fact that for me, it's e sometimes it's easy to say that when you've just joined a church, you go, wow, I love this church because it's amazing. But I tell you, maturity is staying in love with the bride when you've been there for a long time. When Fiona walked down that aisle, the 22nd of February, 2014, and I saw her in white, my breath was taken away, an ugly tear started to flow from me, not her. She didn't cry once. She was happy. But when I saw her, I was like, I would do anything for this girl. She is so beautiful, she's extravagant. Let me tell you, maturity is now 10 years in a marriage, two kids later, do I still love her with the same devotion? Do I still look at her and going, now I know a lot more about her. Now I know a lot more of the flaws. Now is she, vice versa, knows a lot more of the flaws. But maturity is, do I still love the bride? Do I still want to lay my life down for her? Maturity is actually being a part of a community and knowing the flaws, knowing the brokenness, knowing the frustrations, and still saying, she's still beautiful to me. 
It's not an optional extra, but secondly, also I realize in this thing where Peter starts to talk to the elders, the leaders, the, the pastors of this community, he's reminding them that actually church is not on our terms. It's not on an optional extra, but it's also not on our terms. It's this idea of godly leadership. I, I grew up in a church, um, as I mentioned, in Durban uh, in the early 2000s, encountered this man and his wife called Piet and Jenny Wallace. And uh, this, as we walk, came from Zimbabwe, we arrived there, and I can still remember the moment where at that first Christmas where we had lost everything financially as a family. They came as, a, as an eldership and they placed an envelope in our hands. They did not really know us and they said, here's a thousand rand from us as a church to bless you this Christmas so that you guys will be able to have a Christmas dinner together as a family and be able to buy some gifts. We were like, who are these people that would do that? And as we knitted our hearts into that community, those people were the same people, those leaders, when I f finished school and I said, I want to go full time into ministry. And they said, that's amazing, but you should go and study something else first. And I was like, how dare they? I've heard from God. They mustn't tell me damper this excitement, but I re realized that actually God has placed me in this community with leadership over me. So I said, I don't want to go study but I'll do it because that's what I believe God has placed me in, in this, under godly authority. I went and studied something else and God did something incredible in my heart and brought maturity in my heart so that at the right time, that same people were the people who released me and it was the same man that said to me, one night said to me, I tell me, Gabe, your future lies with a man named Wally Gertzmeyer. And that same voice sent me here to Cape Town to this church, Life Changes, over 15 years ago because I believe God said, you've submitted yourself under his leadership. It's this, this reality in a world where everything was to kick out of, I submit to nobody. When God says, no, but there's a leadership that I'm put over you that actually will be called, there's high responsibility, as you read the text, that there's a high responsibility. God will judge the leadership of churches harshly and strictly. But I also believe that there's also a high reward for good godly leadership. It says that there will be a great reward for godly leadership. And I tell you, there's a responsibility on us as individuals to say, will we come under the leadership God's place in our lives? Because there's that responsibility, but there's also a reward for us when we come under it. And I want to keep reminding us to that reality because for me, as I submitted, I remember sitting across the table as an arrogant teenager saying to Piet Wallace in Durban, why am I not leading worship? And he said to me, do you want to know why? And then I realized it wasn't an oversight. He actually had reasons why I wasn't leading worship. And he started to challenge me about my character and the things that, I, that were not lining up with the word of God. And I remember in that moment, do I get offended or do I come under that and say, God, but I trust you with my future. I look now, last weekend, preaching at a church in Switzerland, led by that same man, as I'm preaching there to a congregation of 250 people, declaring the gospel there with this man, Piet there, who I think 20-something years ago, he was a man giving my family an envelope with a thousand rand in it. I go, only God can do that. Only God can do that. So I love the fact in this reality that Peter is pulling us towards this, this reality, this, this call. But the reason why I believe is Peter says this in verse 4. He says, because when the great shepherd appears. The pastors, the leaders here are just under shepherds. There's a great shepherd named Jesus Christ. And Peter knew the shepherd. When he says the great shepherd, he's referring to John chapter 10. Jesus described himself in the teaching as the good shepherd. And Peter's learned that after 30 tough years, life is hard years, where he has fallen at every single pit stop. He has made a mess of many situations, but the great shepherd has walked him through all of it. He's able to say, let me tell you about the great shepherd. When I fell, the great shepherd came to me and said, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Love them, serve them, lay your life down to them as I have done for you. He's been faithfully shepherded. And it's this reality that when he comes in, Peter's not coming as an apostle. He could come as an apostle and say, I am an apostle, you do what I say. But if you see in verse one, he says, as a fellow elder, as a fellow shepherd, as a fellow pastor, I'm just coming in humility to saying, this is the high call. Not trying to establish myself as a, the pinnacle, but the highest call is me coming feeding the sheep, serving the sheep, laying my life down for the sheep. And I love this reality. He's reminding us there's a great shepherd who leads us, who calls us, but he actually says, actually, it's gonna be done in community. That's his opening soul, though. And then he takes a breath, and he wants to take us on the next few verses, saying, I wanna give you a strategy in community as you submit yourself to godly leadership, what to do when life is hard. He wants to help us and give us a strategy, and I wanna help articulate that as best I can in the next 20 minutes, what to do when life is hard. I'd love you to take some notes and remind yourself because I think you're going to have to know this when the pressure starts to hit. 
When the Monday morning alarm clock goes and everything inside you says, I cannot face the day. When, when the relationship is on, on, on a rocky ground and you don't know where to put your next step, what am I going to do? When your emotions betray you, when your relationships betray you, when your finances are, are depleted, what to do when life is hard? Number one, Peter tells us, humble yourself. When life is hard, humble yourself. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. What is so incredible is if you read in your, in your text there, you would have seen there's little asterisks above one of the quotes there. He quotes Proverbs chapter 3, where he says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What I love about that verse, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's quoted, if you turn one book prior, the book of James, James is quoting the same proverb. Proverbs chapter 3, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter and James were two buddies who used to follow Jesus. It's almost like they're re-preaching everything Jesus told them. I can imagine there were guys who struggled a little bit with arrogance because they both have heard this proverb told them many times, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So they've learned this journey after 30 years, and both of them are saying, guys, this is real. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And if we just think about that for a second, I don't know about you, but when I read that verse, it says God opposes, he violently comes against, he resists the proud, he, he pushes away the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. I just think that just stirs something deep in my soul. And as Peter goes on, he says, so therefore, if that is the reality, that there's grace, divine grace that's flowing from God to those who are humble, this is our response. Humble yourself. Now, let me tell you, when life is hard and relationship tensions and you're feeling angst in your heart because of that person and what they say and how unfair they've treated you and everything is stirring up inside of you, the Bible says this is your first response when life is hard is humble yourself. Not ask for God to humble the other person. Not God, humble my boss. Humble my spouse. Humble my father-in-law. No, he says there's a choice. You have to choose to humble yourself. Let me tell you, I think so many relationships, futures, and spiritual inheritances have been lost because people refuse to access this grace. Where God is saying, I am eager to pour out grace to those who are humble but I've sat on counseling couch after counseling couch, lounges with husbands and wives at loggerheads, with business partners at loggerheads, with church leadership teams at loggerheads, where if just one would humble themselves, things would be radically different. But they violently choose, we are not going to because you don't know what they said, you don't know what they did, and because of that, God says, I resist the proud. You don't access the grace that is available. Philippians 2 says this, says, don't be selfish, or try to impress others, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Think of others as better than yourself. Let me tell you, I've got a problem. It's confessing. I think about me way too much. I consume my own thoughts all the time. What people think of me, how did I do, how did I come across, what the, wh wh why did they respond that way, how come they wouldn't re re invite me to that thing, what is going on with that reality, why is that person looking at me funny, me, 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 me. And actually I think a lot of times, if I'm honest, I'll, in the dark of night when I'm thinking about a situation or reality or how something went, I'm very good at talking myself into being the hero of my story. I, I am right. How dare they say that? And I, and, I, and I would hasten to say, I think that the reality is a lot of us, we talk and strategize what we will say and then what they might say and then how we will trump that and go, ha, that's why you're wrong. And we think this, and we, we go in a, a back and forth all night. And when they say that, when I'll say that, and we go through the motions of that reality. But here is what humility is. True biblical humility, according to Philippians, according to 1 Peter, isn't thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's not saying, oh, but if I, if I humble myself, then they're gonna just, they're gonna walk right over me. No, 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 it's saying, humble yourself, think, think of yourself less. But here's the wonderful reality. It says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. 
This doesn't mean it's groveling and saying, you're right, you're right, and saying and lying and saying, you're right even when I'm wrong. It's not even saying that you have to do that, but hum humility starts with humble yourself under God's mighty hand. And that's the, when he says that God's mighty hand, it's a reference back to the book of Exodus where God rescued his people with a strong outstretched arm and a mighty hand. He rescued and redeemed people when they'd been enslaved for 430 years, but they, had, they came under the hand of God and he redeemed them. They're saying, actually, this situation, when life is hard, I'm going to humble myself under God's mighty hand. Because the scripture says, in due time, at the proper time, at the kairos time, at the God-appointed time, he will lift you up. I love that when it says in due time, it's saying, but, 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 but they haven't changed. I've humbled myself, but they haven't changed. Well, God said, yeah, because it's not the due time yet. I'll, I'll do it. But, but my boss hasn't recognized me yet. When will my time come? God says, no, when you humble yourself under my mighty hand, at the due time, when I deem it the time, I will lift you up. I will exalt you. It's the difference between us clawing and fighting for platforms and promotion, which is exhausting, fighting and clawing, how can I be proved right in the situation and allowing his mighty hands to exalt you? It's the difference between Olivia, when she was little, learning the monkey bars at school, and those little arms did not have the same upper body strength as her father. She was there, and she was trying, but she'll make it to two, and she'll get stuck, and she was trying, to, how do I get enough momentum? And it looks exhausting, and she's like, help, I'm trying to do it. And then all of a sudden, big dad, Gabe John Cena Phillips comes behind. Big Jake Paul Phillips, yeah, comes and with my mighty hands underneath her, come and I lift her up. And suddenly, all of a sudden, she's Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. She's on the way, not because of her great strength, but because at the right time, her dad has come and just elevated her at the moment. It's a life. I think that we are becoming a people that when life is hard, we become our own worst enemies. Because we're fighting for things that we, and we're trying to push our way forward. And life is hard. And we put my head down. I'm going to fight and wrestle. And God says, no, humble yourself under my mighty hand. At the due time, I will exalt you. So let me tell you, when you wake up tomorrow morning and you think today is going to be hard, my spouse, my boss, that client, that colleague, that contract negotiation, humble yourself. When life is hard, number two, Peter tells us to have this reality of anxieties being cast. He says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Sociologists Tell us that stress comes from three pl uh, places. People, problems, pressures. People, if you think about it for a second, you could probably name the person who's causing you stress. Am I right? Don't shout it out loud because they might be here. <laughs> Definitely don't shout it out if it's me. Problems and pressures. And a lot of our prayer life is, God, if only you would remove one of these three things from our life, then I'll have peace. Remove that person. Get over that problem. Get through the season. If I, just, if I can get through the season, then I'm going to be peaceful. But what we do is then we end up tying our peace to the outcome of a situation, and that is temporary and volatile at best. Peter here is giving them encouragement to stop carrying our anxieties, because that's what a lot of us do. We carry our burdens. We carry our anxieties. And he says, I want you to learn a new te technique of casting your anxieties. He says, cast your anxieties. He's not denying the reality of the things that bring anxiety. He's not saying, pretend they don't exist. No, he says, they're real. But what you do with them is up to you. Life is hard. He's saying, yes, cast your anxieties onto him. It is this idea that in Numbers chapter 6, there's this prayer where he, the, the, the high priest would pray, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make his face shine upon you, the Lord give you peace. And when he says the Lord give you peace, he's establishing reality that it's not a pastor who gives you peace. It's not a spouse, a relationship, a meeting, a system, an economy, a government that will give you peace. But that's how transactional our relation becomes. If only that thing changes, then I'll have peace. But there's this idea that the Lord, he says, I am the Lord and I give peace. And that's the reality. When God describes himself, he describes himself in this idea of peace, which I think a lot of us need desperately in our hearts when life is hard, in three ways. He calls himself, number one, Jehovah Shalom. Jehovah Shalom means the Lord, your peace. I love that. The Lord, your peace. 
In a sense, it's, it's the intimate reality of who God is, saying, I'm close, I'm near, I'm personally available for you. He says, I know the things that keep you awake at night. I know the things that raise your blood pressure. It's not the peace like a Miss Universe candidate says, I want world peace. No. He says, I'm Jehovah Shalom, your peace. The intimate peace that knows the depths of your soul. He also says, I'm the prince of peace. Not just intimate, but he says, I'm transcendent. I'm above it all. I'm not just in your circumstance, but I'm actually above your circumstance. And finally, he says, I am the God of peace. The God of peace. That means he's not just intimate, not just transcendent, but he says, I'm ultimate. I clear away the playing field. And this is the reality. When we understand who he is in this transaction, we stop carrying our anxieties and re reminding ourselves about who, what they are and what they said and how I did it. How am I going to carry this through? How am I going to make that thing work? And how is this going to come through? Actually, going, no, every day I'm going to choose when life is hard, I'm going to cast my anxieties onto him. It's not being mindless but rather mindful of who holds our anxieties. Jehovah Shalom, Prince of Peace, God of Peace, the intimate, transcendent, ultimate says, I want those anxieties. Let me carry them. Because he cares for you. He says, I'll give you a peace that passes all understanding. As you cast your anxieties, Philippians 4 says, he gives us a peace that passes all understanding. A peace that goes beyond logic. A peace that goes beyond the doctor's diagnosis. A peace that goes beyond the state of the nation. A peace that passes all understanding. And here is the thought for, process for you and I. Is if we want the peace that goes beyond our understanding, we sometimes have to give up the right to have the understanding. If you want the peace that goes beyond your logic, you have to sometimes give up your logic and say, God, I trust you. The Bible goes on and says, His peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. In Romans 16, it says, The God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath his feet. He fights and wages war on our behalf. So we cast our anxieties. So I tell you today that when you wake up tomorrow morning and you think today is going to be hard because of all the stress and the worry I'm carrying, Gabe, you don't know the, the, the stuff I'm carrying. Cast your anxiety onto him. Thirdly, Humble yourself. Anxiety is cast. Thirdly, Peter encourages us to resist the devil. He says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. He says these words at the get-go. Watch out. Be sober-minded. Be vigilant, be alert. It's like an alarm clock reality saying, wake up, wake up, we are, wake up. Your adversary, the devil. Or as the New Living Translation says, your great enemy. And if you think about it, how profound that statement is. Peter knows these guys are under the political thumb of a man named Nero. He knows that they are, they are the problem X in society that everyone wants to eradicate. No one wants to do business with them. If I'm writing that letter, I say, be, watch out, be vigilant for that guy Nero. He's got spies everywhere. So keep it quiet. Be careful of your neighbors who are wanting to sell you out. Be careful of the system that's taking your home and shutting down your business. But no, Peter doesn't say that's the great enemy. He says, watch out, be sober-minded, be vigilant, alert for your great adversary, the devil. He reminds us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood. When life is hard, you have to remind yourself you're not fighting against flesh and blood. You're fighting in a spiritual battle. You see, there are two extremes. The first extreme is, have, is somebody who sees the devil behind every bush. You know those people? Oh, that's the devil. That devil did it. Hansi Kronja, that devil made me do it. Maybe he did, but also you made a choice. But let me tell you, the second, what I actually think is might be, the, for us, contextually, the, the bigger danger is being totally unaware of the devil's schemes. According to Peter, we have two enemies, the devil and ignorance of the devil. Because he's saying, be alert. Wake up, wake up. It's not, just not about just making it through. Life is hard, make it through. He knows he's, there's a bigger journey ahead. And what he says about the enemy, he says, this enemy, the, your great adversary, is prowling, roaring, and devouring. He's prowling, meaning he's persistent and ever-present. 
He's like a barking chihuahua that will not let you alone. You know, just, just get away. And then just think, it's there again. And, he will, and he'll come. The Bible says he's accused of the brethren. Night and day, he keeps coming. It's not like I want, oh, I'm free from the devil. No, the devil says, oh, I'll wait for another moment. I'm coming again. Genesis chapter four, God speaks to Cain, says to him, be careful, Cain. Be alert, be sober-minded, be vigilant because sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you. This idea of he's crouching, looking. And I'm not here to put some undue fear in your heart, but I think I wanna awaken you because the enemy is prowling. But also that he's also roaring. Peter, the apostle Peter says he's roaring. And what does, when a lion roars, it's there to incite fear. And when I think about the church, I think the enemy is intimidating. Getting the church to cower. When life is hard, buckle down because it's so tough. And the enemy's roaring and the fears are bigger and bigger. And I'm going to die alone and nobody loves me. And this thing's going to take place. And they'll always battle with the situation. My kids are too far gone. How am I going to feed my family? The relationship is broken and the enemy is roaring. There's no hope for you. Turn and run. But let me tell you, it goes and says he's prowling, he's roaring, but he's also seeking to devour. Again, this is, I believe, Peter was just regurgitating Jesus' sermons to him. In John 10, when Jesus is talking about himself being the good shepherd, it's only just another verse later where he says, I am the good shepherd. But let me tell you about the enemy. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Satan doesn't come just to make your life a little bit harder. Life is hard, shame. He's there to destroy you in that moment. He's there to rip you to shreds, to tear you apart, to strip you away from him. And that's why I say when life is hard, we have to have a strategy. Because the enemy is prowling. He's roaring, he's waiting to devour you when you get captured by the harsh realities of life. So what Peter's strategy is this? He says, resist him. Resist him. And if I can speak with as much pastoral strength today, that what you and I refuse to confront will not change. What you and I refuse to confront in our lives will not change. I'm calling us as sons and daughters of God in this time, when life is hard, find your God-given authority again. Stop submitting to the sufferings and the pressures. They're real. I know that. I'm not undermining that. That doctor's diagnosis is real. I'm not undermining that. The, 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 the friend's comments are real. I'm not undermining that. The relational situation is real. I'm not undermining that. But actually, let me tell you, life is hard, but God is good. And he says, resist with all authority. Resist the devil. Too many of us are allowing the enemy to have a field day in our families too many of us are allowing the enemy to have a field day in our sexuality. Too many of us are allowing the enemy to have a field day in our thought life. The enemy, I can see him just waltzing into our, our homes day after day, opening our fridge, eating our food, and taking a seat at our table, and none of us are making a difference. We're allowing it to, to be setting the tone in our homes, allowing it to set the tone in our marriages, and going, I wish it was different. I must, I must pray about it. No, he says, don't pray about it. Resist it. Resist. Let me tell you a personal story is that I am the most positive guy I know, Bar Brett Anderson. It is in every personality test, positivity is number one. But I, I like to say it's not positivity, it's faith, people. It's faith. But I tell you, I can see the, the, the good out of every situation. And I think it's a God-given gift, a personality wiring of God, and I'm so grateful for it. But it was this time... In the, early in the year where it was for the first time in my life that I felt a malaise come upon me that I felt was bigger than just a bad day. A, a, a funk that I just, I, I, no one would know it except my wife, just the reality of I'm struggling to find joy. And I couldn't tie it to a situation. I couldn't tie it to a reality. I couldn't tie it to something has shaped externally. And I, and I started to think, what do I do? And I, 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 I humbled myself. I talked it through with my wife. I actually went and I spoke to a counselor. I checked my diet, my sleep patterns. My wife makes me go running, physical, do that stuff. It's all, and they're all good things, wonderful things. Until I suddenly realized, hey, this isn't from God. This is not something to be nursed. 
It's not something just to be endured and walk through. I go, of course, of course, be alert or wake up, Gabe. Of course the enemy is coming after my joy. Of course the enemy is coming after my relationships and wanting to affect those things. Of course the enemy is wanting to come after my church's future. Of course. Let me tell you, if a lion comes walking into my camp, if I was there with my kids and starts intimidating me and my family, I'm not sitting down and having a chat to reason with the lion. What are your motives here? So I'll tell you what I did. Is that for week after week, I'll go for a run. I put headphones in my ear and I had the same song at the end. Every time I run, 5Ks people, athletes. But I'd run until tears would come down my face, declaring who Jesus is, not because I felt like it. I'd have hands lifted. If you saw me on uh, the Blowberry Beach front, I apologize. <laughs> hands lifted, singing out loud, not caring what people were thinking. And I'd sing these lines over and over. I can see a cloud heavy with rain, and it looks like revival is headed our way. Oh, I can see a cloud heavy with rain, and it looks like salvation is headed our way. I can hear a sound, the abundance of rain, and it sounds like freedom, and it's headed our way. I can hear a sound, the abundance of rain, and it sounds like provision, and it's headed our way. Oh, I can see a cloud heavy with rain, and it looks like healing, it's headed our way. Oh, I can see a cloud, and it's heavy with rain, and it looks like joy, and it's headed our way. And I'll sing it, and I'll sing it, and I'll sing it, and I, not until I felt it, but until I believed it. Because I'm not led by my feelings, I'm led by my convictions. And I'll sing and I'll sing it, and it's this narrative that I remember and I rehearse and I remind in my head of this prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 18. He's a man that is seeing that life is hard. Three years of drought nationally. Demonic intimidation of God's people. He's isolated, he's alone, and he feels like there's nobody's with him. And he's on top of a mountain, and he starts to look out, and it looks like there's nothing happening. And he knows that God needs to come in and break into the situation. So he starts to pray, and he puts his head between his knees, and he prays and says, God, would you send rain? And he looks up and he sees nothing. So he tells the servant, Go out and have a look. And the servant says, Nothing. He does it again. And again, and again, and again, and again, in a posture of humility, in a posture of saying, God, I'm casting my anxieties on you, but also in a posture of I'm resisting what the climate of the world says. I'm not going along, and just the situation is normal. He starts to look until he suddenly said, the seventh time, he looked out, and the servant came back and says, I can see a cloud, and it's heavy with rain. Looks like the size of a man's fist. The hand of God started to move on a situation again and rain overtook them in a moment. Let me tell you in this reality, some of you here, I believe, have been battling the secret Goliath called depression, called the irrational thoughts, called anxiety for so long. I believe with courage, I'm not a counselor, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm a pastor. And I tell you, like my pastor Peter does in the word here, he says this, resist the devil! I don't know the diagnosis, but I tell you, resist the devil. How did Jesus do it? I believe it's God is giving us our song back. Jesus in the wilderness faced the enemy, and the enemy came, and he did not reason with the devil. He did not say, let me explain the timing, devil. He just said, it is written. It is written. I can see a cloud, and it's heavy with rain. I believe joy is breaking through into homes again. We start to realize that when life is hard, we have a different response. So tomorrow, when you wake up and you think today is going to be hard because the enemy is prowling, he's roaring, and he's seeking to devour me, resist the devil. Fourthly and finally, humble yourself. Anxiety is cast. Resist the devil. Fourthly, understand the dominion of God. He finishes in verse 10 to 11. He says, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ. He will restore himself, restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I love that text that says the God of all grace. Monday grace, Tuesday grace, Wednesday grace, Thursday grace, Friday grace, Saturday grace, Sunday grace, end of the month grace, the day the rent is due grace, tough marriage days grace, the lonely day's grace, the rejected day's grace, the forgotten day's grace, the depressed day's grace. He's the God of all grace. Oh, when life is hard, let me remind you, He's the God of all grace. He's not the God of all works. 
pull yourself up, try harder. No, he says, when life is hard, don't pull yourself up by the bruise traps. Understand the dominion of God. He's the God of all grace. And he tells us he's also the God of eternal glory. He's the God of all grace. He will sustain. He's the God of eternal glory. He will reward. He has not forgotten you. He has not left you alone. He has not abandoned you. This is temporary. There is a higher reality. I can tell you with absolute conviction because of the word of God, all wrongs against you in his glory will be set right. All mockery will be vindicated. All shame in this world will be replaced with honor. All pain will be removed. All losses will be restored. All humiliation will be exchanged for garments of glory. All brokenness will be mended. All slander will be revealed and proved false. All anonymity for His sake will be replaced with fame and glory. Because the scripture says He will, He will restore. He will confirm. He will establish. He will bring strength. Because His dominion is this. Dominion means His authority, His command, His control, His jurisdiction, His power, and His sway. And when we understand this reality, when life is hard, we say, I'm coming under your dominion, God. I'm humbling myself under your mighty hand. In due time, you will lift me up. I'm not carrying my anxieties. I'm casting them on you. I'm resisting the devil, and he will flee from me. I'm finding my song again. I'm standing firm in my faith, and I'm coming under your dominion, that even now the things I cannot control, the things that are way out of my grasp, I trust you that you're the God of all grace. You will sustain but you're also the God of all eternal rewards. You will reward in due time. This is where life gets hard. Humble yourself, anxiety cars, resist the devil, dominion of God, H-A-R-D. When life is hard, we need a strategy because God is good. Can we stand to our feet? Every morning, when life is hard, can you say to me, say, humble yourself. When life is hard, say, anxiety is cast. When life is hard, say, resist the devil. When life is hard, say, the dominion of God. Because let me tell you, this is the courage I want to put in you. Peter says, the enemy, your great adversary, is prowling, is roaring like a lion. He says he's like a lion. The best illustration. The other places say he's a ser- like a serpent. He's he's like a he's like a dragon. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's the father of lies. But here he says he's like a lion. Yes, he's real. But I love the fact that we serve a God who says, "But I am the real deal." Life is hard, but God is good. The enemy is like a lion, and you might have been roaring. That roar is loud, intimidating, bring fear, and he wants to destroy you. Let me tell you, awake to us the reality. But there's a greater lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is who he is. Revelations 5 verse 5 says, And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Let me tell you, life is hard, but even in that, he promises life to the full. Can we lift our hands as high as we can? I believe as I preach the word of God today, I believe the lion of the tribe of Judah is wanting to roar his life into every situation. Into family dynamics where couples are trusting for children and say, I don't know what to do with my daughter. I don't know what to do with the mental health. Right now, I thank you, Jesus, that you're roaring, roaring right now over that family. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the lion who roars. And when the enemy is prowling and he's wanting to roar intimidation and fear, I thank you right now, we resist the devil, not with our own bravado, but we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We anxiety cast, we throw it upon you because you care for us. We resist the devil. But I thank you, Father God, we believe the dominion of God, the God of all grace, the God of eternal reward, right now declares, I am roaring over you. I thank you, Father God, over marriages that are shaking and quaking right now. I thank you, God, right now over businesses that say, I don't know how I'm going to pay next month's salaries. I thank you, Father God, over people who are in here saying, I am so broken. The things that I have done to myself, the, the defiling I have done right now, Father God, where the enemy is roaring, failure! I thank you that the line of the tribe of Judah says, life is hard, but God is good. And you roar over us right now. You roar over us right now. I thank you, Jesus, you're giving your church, your people, a different posture. We humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We cast our anxieties upon you because you care for us. 
We resist the devil knowing that he will flee from us. He will no longer have a seat on our table. I can see a cloud. It's heavy with rain. And it looks like revival. It looks like provision. It looks like breakthrough. It looks like healing. It looks like joy. It looks like Jesus coming your way. And we come now, surrender to the dominion of God. When life is hard, we receive your grace. So I thank you, Father, right now for every heart in this room to be strengthened. Every heart in this room right now, Father God, to be restored, confirmed, and established in your truth. I know I've gone long, but just one more second. If you are in this room and you say, I've been battling with depression, I've been battling with anxiety, I've been battling with irrational thoughts, they've been plaguing me, and I've been in that spiral for a long time, and, and you've, you've said, maybe it's biological, maybe it's chemical, and, and I don't know, and I'm not wavering into that. I'm just saying right now, I believe faith in my heart, this is the journey God is setting me free from again and again, resisting the devil and allowing his grace to flow. If that's you, I have faith to pray for you. If that's you, can you lift your hands? If you, if, if everyone else, hands down, but if that's you, can you lift your hands? Father, right now, I thank you that we take hold of what you have taken hold of us for. I pray right now that you have given us the mind of Christ. I thank you, Jesus, right now that you have, you have established us as your own. So right now, I come against the, the lies and the accusations of the enemy. Right now, the thoughts that have plagued us and keep us up at night, the, the rational thoughts that keep us in a loop. I, right now, I rebuke the spirit of OCD I rebuke the infirmity, that spirit, that of fear that holds us captive. Right now, I thank you, Jesus. We allow the roar of God, the roar of God, order to minds, order to thinking, freedom, joy. I thank you, Lion of the tribe of Judah. Right now, would you roar, roar. I feel God is roaring futures over people. Where men and women have put a full stop and said, this is who I am, this is what I'll do, this is my situation. I Right now, the roar of God is going out. I declare this and I believe it right now. We thank you, Jesus. Our response is to humble ourselves and say, I don't know what to do, but God can. We cast our anxieties, we resist the devil come under your dominion. When life is hard, God is good. We pick this weapon up today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day and this is how we'll fight for our futures. Fight for our children. Fight for our marriages. Fight for our nation. Fight for our friends. When life is hard, God is good. Amen.